give a great big KetoCon 2023 welcome to Sally Norton. Thank you for being here. Here come the oxalates to a toilet bowl near you. Every day, every visit, and you don't even know it. Usually it's not in this form. These are the microcrystals. You do pee these out every day. If there's a lot of them, it gets messy and cloudy. And the most toxic form, this is calcium oxalate you're looking at. It has all these diverse ways to be toxic. And this is nanocrystalline calcium oxalate. This is the most toxic form of oxalate in your body. This study showed very quickly, one spinach smoothie, it's hard for me to know where we are in the slides, severe oxidative stress, super lot of these nanocrystals from one spinach smoothie in your bladder, shedding the cells in your bladder. Too much oxalate in the body is a toxic condition that no one's paying attention to. We consume too much of it and the precursors that can also become oxalate in the body. And this undermines the basic functioning of every cell in the body that it gets to. You keep adding this toxin day in and day out over time, you've got something far worse than the immediate microcrystals and nanocrystals in your toilet bowl. They're everywhere. And where do they come from? Your diet. You're eating oxalic acid in plant foods, things like almonds and beets. And vitamin C, too much vitamin C from natural foods or from supplements becomes oxalate in the body. And a very small fraction of oxalate in your body comes from the breakdown of connective tissue, from hydro uh, hydroxyproline, these kind of connective tissue, collagen type amino acids, but a very small sliver. The rest of it is all about what you eat. Oxalate is connected to many major diseases, the diseases we all say we care about, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and a disease that's far worse in terms of numbers that also causes death, osteoporosis and osteopenia, chronic inflammation, a plague we have today, and metabolic damage. Why are these so common now? Healthy people coming down with these problems, these are normal now for all of us. And we're acting like we don't know that oxalate interferes with the nutritional quality of your diet, binds minerals, makes it very difficult for you to use minerals, causes you to lose minerals in the body, B vitamins as well, disturbing electrolytes, which upsets cell function. When cells are damaged, they lose electrolytes, and this is a vicious cycle. Energy production is down, mitochondria are struggling, cell communications are off, and your ability to protect yourself from pathogens is compromised seriously, and your ability to maintain tissues is compromised seriously. Oxalate is a major toxin to mitochondria and cells, and that is a big problem. You're living with a brownout condition when you eat a high oxalate diet, and you may not even notice that because you have so much capacity. Your body has so many ways to make you think you're okay when you're not. David Perlmutter is right. You can have massive breakthroughs if you know about oxalate, including weight loss, including metabolic health, and let's look at a couple case examples real quick. For years, for most of her life, eating vegetables and then getting into the smoothies and so on, years of really serious autoimmune things and pain. And it only took a few days for her to notice the difference. Keto is getting some people in big trouble. And this person, this is a woman who was helped with keto after eating spinach smoothies and berries and baking with almond flour for long enough and her pain was so bad she was quite disabled and felt like she was slowly dying. Does anyone in here feel they've been affected by oxalate? Would you be willing to stand up? Some of you might know what it's like to feel like you're dying. And the rest of you, hopefully you'll see who those people are and have a conversation with them to know what this is like. So what's, what's valuable, too, is to recognize that I can't go backwards, that two to three days, two to three days without the almonds and the spinach or whatever it is, that's not the protein fixing all your tissues. 
That's the toxicity relief. You can get toxicity relief very quickly. And that tells you a lot. You can start thinking if you can observe healing happening, you, the body will teach you things you don't even understand about how it works. You have to be willing to listen. This is a gentleman, age 55 years old, in the hospital severely with severe heart problems. The doctor can't believe he's alive. He can barely believe he's alive. Very quickly, he's recognized that his plant-based keto diet was behind this. This diet is nutritionally inadequate and quite toxic, and hopefully you'll get a taste of that. Thing is, we should already know that these foods are dangerous to turn into daily staples, and we don't because we're not paying attention to existing science. We keep thinking we've got a fresh idea and adding a fresh idea to how we should live, and we're getting into trouble. Out of concern for oxalic acid being the perfect murder weapon, this toxicology experiment, this is the first experimental study in the field of toxicology published in 1823. It was obvious, after poisoning many animals, that the more dilute the oxalic acid, the more toxic and the more quickly it could cause death. Dilute oxalic acid, almond milk. Watery oxalic acid, spinach smoothie, a juice. We're empowering oxalate because we don't want to listen to a guy who was really smart back in the 1800s. And he was smart because people were dropping dead of oxalate poisoning and they knew it could be used as a murder weapon and they wanted to be able to detect that it was oxalic acid was the cause of death, but it could not. It's very difficult to find this in the tissues even when you're looking for it. But we're not looking for it, are we? So, of course, oxalate gets away with a literal slow murder. Not the dramatic kind necessarily, but that can happen too. So here's a lovely paleo recipe that's keto, using three bunches of chard. You can get two grams, or almost two and a half grams, depending on whether you use white or red stem chard, in one meal. That's not good, because you're basically eating a cleaner that's going to clean your clock. This is the little acid molecule. You see the little C's and O's, two carbons, four oxygens, with negative charges. That negative charge one or two can do all kinds of magic that you don't like, like pull the rust off a rusty engine, clean the rust out of your patio, and do some interesting things. So it's a very effective bleach and a very effective cleaner, but it's not necessarily great food. Uh, so what kind of problems? If you've got too much oxygen in the body, chances are you're going to have some kind of joint pain, like gout, often affecting the neck, the feet, the wrists. GI issues are pretty much guaranteed. Kidney stones, Pelvic pain, urinary tract pain, cloudy urine. Those are when you have a lot of those microcrystals bouncing light all over the place. It looks kind of milky. And then there's the whole nervous system isn't happy. The brain is foggy. The memory isn't great. You're having trouble sleeping, persistent fatigue, depression and anxiety. This is all neurotoxicity, skin problems, vision loss, circulation problems, glandular failure. And the symptoms kind of wax and wane and do weird things. You kind of make them go away for a while. And you think you got it. You think you got it and you don't. So the science, oxalic acid is this little chelating chemical that binds with minerals and creates these salts. And when you get enough pairs of these salts together, they come together and they form a little seed crystal and become a nano crystal that really toxic, toxic form. The acid is toxic enough. And they can build into microcrystals. And you can see again, here's pictures of the crystals. The top picture is what? Urinary crystals that you saw before. The middle picture is the surface of a kidney stone. And the bottom picture is a picture of two of the shapes that plants deliberately build, including that toothpick shape, the raphide, which is designed as a blowgun, a, a, a dart to get you. It can penetrate two cells deep, but the cell lining of your mouth and digestive tract is only one cell deep. This causes uh, a problem. This is abrasion. It's also electrostatic, and it's not nice on the digestive tract and can get you in, all the way to inflammatory bowel disease, barrier function problems where you end up with allergies, and nerve problems where you have motility problems where you have 
fecal incontinence. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, constipation is not much more fun, and neither is diarrhea, or just uh, things moving in the wrong direction and getting reflux and other issues. Cysts and tumors. So it creates cystic problems as well in the body. Now, and this acid's coming along in your food and happening along the absorptive cells and digestive tract, and it floats in between these digestive cells and digestive tract in the water fraction. So if you have a really great gut, you get this tight pathway, and maybe 10 or 15% of that acid that you're eating is getting in. But of course, if it's an almond milk, maybe you're getting a lot more just because you're delivering it in that beautiful dilute solution that can so easily float into the body with the water in the almond milk. Then you have gut inflammation. Now, nobody has that. And you've got absorption that could be 50 or 60%. You don't even need a high oxalate diet to be in trouble with oxalates. A lot of foods have been knighted as fabulous superfoods. And we're getting ourselves in trouble because we really trust them. And underneath, it's causing illness. You can literally ruin your health eating healthy food. And that is so unfair. We're trying to do the right thing, and we're working on misinformation. So here you've gone keto, so you've cut out the potatoes. You're no longer doing that. And buckwheat and the grains are gone and you substitute that with more nuts, more spinach and chard. Oh, you get to have chocolate on keto if you're willing to eat 99.9% .9 cacao. And then you got the seeds and so on. This could go from bad to worse, you see. And that's not so great. And the thing is, you don't have to go away from plants completely. There's a, a way to curate the diet and just learn about where oxalates in, in our diet. So in the leafy green department, you've got four and really only three and really only two leafy greens because beet greens and red chard is the same vegetable and white chard is a little less, but they're still worse than spinach, which is considered the poster child for oxalate poisoning. And then sorrel, if you garden or like fancy food, maybe you eat sorrel, but that is not a long list. It shouldn't be a hard sell to say, you know what, you don't need spinach. It's a hard sell to say you don't need spinach. <laughs> but all the other greens are really not that big a deal from an oxalate standpoint. But if you've let oxalate ruin your gut, you may not be able to handle them either. Now, if you've got my beginner's guide, and I do have some with me if you need it, you've seen this graph. And this graph is trying to explain about the magnitude of things. So the middle graph that has the colors on it, see the color bar graph there? The yellow area with that purple arrow is, is saying 250 milligrams a day defines a high oxalate food. And 600 milligrams a day defines a super extremely high oxalate diet, okay? And you can see that these foods that we love and trust so well can easily get you to a toxic level of oxalate consumption in a, like one meal. Just have a little iced tea with lunch and a handful of almonds and a little chocolate bar on the way home from work and you've done it. It's not hard to do. If you've got a leaky gut, that's a big problem. But if you, if you have a history of eating potatoes, peanuts, whole wheat toast, basic American fruits, <laughs> you've been eating high oxalate since you were chewing. Especially if your mom gave you sweet potatoes as your first food, which is happening. And now parents are giving children unbelievable levels of oxalate that has never been done and should not be done. So here's an example of getting a spinach smoothie with 720 milligrams of oxalate. And within 40 minutes, the circulating immune cells are damaged, putting out pro-inflammatory cytokines and no longer able to handle bacteria. So now you're defenseless because you had a smoothie. And you see this in the real world. I have many clients who've said, you know, I've had these fungal infections forever. Nothing works. I went on the low oxalate diet and now for months and months and months, I'm free of this fungal infection. Cannot believe it. We're just reversing infection, chronic sinus infection, yeast infection. You think of any of these things that are hanging on with people and they're struggling over and over again. The reason we've been on these antibiotics over and over again, because of chronic infections. The spinach smoothie can't fix that. It's just going to keep it in place. And unfortunately, moving from grains to nuts can mean you can turn a novel food like almonds and ground up into cobblers, cakes, muffins, and go to town. Don't even have to do that. You just need an ounce and a half of chocolate, and you've two and a third times higher oxalate in your urine. 
And that's not good for the entire body. In fact, that's the beginning of oxalate accumulation in the body. So when you have one and a half ounce of chocolate with only 55 milligrams of oxalate, you're setting up little bits of oxalate stuck to your tissues. And that's going to stick, especially where you have infection, inflammation, regenerating tissues. Well, your tissues are constantly regenerating. Whatever you used all day needs to be fixed overnight so you're all good the next day. But oxalates are going to hang out there. And there's plenty of science, not enough, it's very small, but we have the evidence both here in the real world and in the scientific world. It's colluding to say the same story that nobody wants to hear. So there's a few ways to get oxalate overload and become toxic with oxalate. Eating a high oxalate diet, having leaky gut where you're absorbing a lot. They don't know why you're absorbing a lot. But if you have an inflammatory bowel disease, you're absorbing a lot. You could also have lots of inflammation and mi mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and that will increase the production of oxalate in the liver. And you can have more oxalate forming in the body. And then, well, you've been eating potatoes, peanuts, and chocolate since you were three, and it's now hanging around in your tissues. So even when you stop eating oxalate, you still have oxalate overload, right? And it's hanging around in your eyes. That's super common. And probably more is going to come through the eyes. The bones and bone marrow. And that's a real problem because you can end up with refractory anemia. The blown cells... The blood cells the bones are trying to make aren't happy and aren't doing well. And of course, there's other ways that oxalate is causing anemia and joint deformities and problems with the bones, including osteopenia and so on. And of course, if you manage to live to middle age, you will die with oxalate in your kidneys and your thyroid gland. 78% of us, maybe it's 85% of us who are over 50, have these crystals. You see those little arrows pointing to that junk there, that's a thyroid gland, and those little chunks there are oxalate crystals. That's not supposed to be there. That's pathology, and that's normal because of our normal diet, right? That's coming from somewhere, and the place you get oxalate is from your diet. It's really simple. <laughs> and the poor spine, all the connected tissues of the spine, your neck, your back, your low back, the fascia, the tendons, the whole thing that holds it together, the bones themselves, the discs, they're all in trouble and they can collect oxalate, including your um, back disc. And the salivary glands concentrate the oxalate that's in your bloodstream by 10 to 40, 30 percent, something like that. That means whenever it's high in your blood, which is when? Four hours after a meal for the next eight something hours, every time you eat, three times a day for years, you've got more oxalate in your salivary glands and you're more prone to salivary stones and tartar on the teeth. And dental problems generally, because oxalate goes to places with lots of circulation and calcium, like your teeth and your jaw. And then there's all that saliva that's also loaded with oxalate. So the teeth are getting it from both sides and your nerves don't like it either. It's very neurotoxic. It can even accumulate in nerves. And perhaps if this is any indication, oxalate could have a connection with multiple sclerosis, MS, where you're losing the myelin on your nerves. It's not good to have little crystals in your nerves or your thyroid glands or your bones or anywhere. Your eyes don't need them. Now you're set up a problem for the immune system. You already have because the immune system got damaged when you ate it, remember? And now you've got crystals in your tissues and the immune system's job is to get rid of them or hide them or do something about them. It can't just have them there. It's got to hide them, coat them, cyst them out, you know, granuloma them. You've got a provocateur in your tissues turning on inflammation. What's the thing that kills us? Inflammation. You could turn down inflammation. Here's a great example that pretty new research. There's research that shows the oxalic acid ion itself causes breast cells to become cancer. And that may be part of this that's missing in this study that shows that when the monocytes come after those crystals that are in your breast because you've been eating potatoes your whole life, it turns on certain cytokines that can transform your normal breast cells into aggressive cancer cells and bone producing cells. So you see this calcium appetite calcium near the tumors, in the tumors and so on. And oxalate has been getting a pass because there's no oxalate there. But who caused that calcium appetite to form in the breast was those oxalate crystals. And when you break down oxalate crystals, what do you get? 
oxalic acid and calcium separate. So you're now spraying not just the cytokines and the pro-inflammatory thing, but this same tissue where you're getting rid of the oxalate crystals are now re-exposed once again to oxalic acid. And they missed that part in this study about how much that is also influencing whether this process turns it into breast cancer. But I can tell you this, if you have breast cancer, taking carrot juice, which we've been doing since the 70s, and spinach smoothies and keto bread, will not fix that cancer. It's going to guarantee that you die with cancer. And that is really unfortunate. But if you're on a low oxide diet, I think you can beat cancer and everything else. You just have to figure out how to manage the fact that you're full of crystals. You're full of crystals, this is a big problem. And I got people in the audience who will attest to the fact that they're full of crystals. So it's not good to get these inflammatory illnesses. And it's really quite interesting that just a small change from using Swiss chard to some other vegetables, you're moving from well over 500 milligrams of oxalate with a little bit of Swiss chard to low oxalate vegetables like rutabaga, roasted radishes, and boiled broccoli, not even 10 milligrams. So, you know, just switch a few vegetables. That's easy enough, provided you can still digest vegetables, which if you have enough gut damage, that may become harder and harder. So, it makes sense that we're moving away from plant-based keto, doesn't it? Seeing why? Like, this may be the reason why everyone's feeling better on carnivore. It's the explanation. This woman heard me speak in Ottawa in 2018, I believe it was, and I said, if you're eating all this almond bread, please stop, and she did. She listened to me, and then she sent me this picture very quickly later. <laughs> Twelve days later, she had her old eczema flare up, and these crystals start popping out. I've never had these crystals popping out. I've had things like these rashes and these ice dyes, which happens early on. Often, if you switch from a fairly high oxalate diet to a low oxalate diet, you might get these rashes. And sometimes they're very itchy and they could last a long time if your immune system's really unhappy about it. Uh, this woman had frostbite, and so she had all kinds of crystals coming out of her nail beds and the skin peeling for over six months. I lost track of her. My feet peeled for seven years. Here's a real whopper in the middle there. That, that's pretty much rock candy, came out of somebody's body, almost as, you know, there's a penny to give you a sense of the size. It's a miracle that your skin can do this. You people who are able to do this, I'm really impressed with you. You're good healers. You're good healers. But there's other ways to get rid of oxalate. The problem is if you're um, not managing it, it can get ugly. So you have to manage the symptoms of the body's immune attack on these crystals that it's trying to get rid of now that you've stopped adding to the pile. You get more electrolyte disturbances, so you're going to have changes in your pulse, your heart function. People end up in the emergency room when their body is clearing out oxalates because they don't know to put enough potassium and sodium and calcium and magnesium back in the system. Electrolyte function and then this cells generally are going to struggle with all this inflammation. It does require a lot of energy. Some people get severe appetite surges out of the blue. Uh, their body's like looking for some juice so it can do this hard work. And you're, you're just going to have some acidity and some malaise and inflammation and metabolic stress because you're healing. And so that's really tricky. Like I'm healing, but now I'm feeling terrible. Yesterday I felt great. Now I feel yeah, what is going on? And we need to make sense of it. That's why I had to write a whole book about it. <laughs> like try to help ex explain this. We can't do this in 30 minutes. In fact, we're down to five. So here's somebody who's been on full carnivore. He struggled a lot with these gout attacks. You see that, you see that gout there and crystals coming out of his face. This is the muscles breaking down, skin issues, and all kinds of calcium coming out. He had the unstable neck and the osteoporosis in his 30s. And in his late 40s, he took a mountain bike ride spill that crushed all five vertebrae of his spine, of his neck. And so he's quadriplegic thanks to oxalates. And now he's recovering from oxalate from a wheelchair. He's been 10 years post, 10 years post his accident, and he's regaining nerve function. He's regaining the function in his voice. He's regaining the work of his diaphragm is now working. He's able to cough and spit like he could not before. He can feel pleasantries in one arm now. 10 years post-surgery. That never happens unless you go on a low oxide diet. 
So these are the three major areas. We saw the skin clearing. You saw the stuff with the urine, and people are pooping out crystal and sand at times as well. Those are the power of the body to get rid of things. But we need to support the body through this difficult work. And sometimes that means adding back in some oxalate to tell the body, no, 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 don't clear so fast. You do not want to move out toxic crystals too fast. You're creating more oxalic acid, more oxidative stress. You're asking a lot of all your excretory systems, and your vascular system is often trafficking in oxalic acid. This is devastating to the vascular system, which is devastating to the tissues they're trying to serve. So we want to slow this down. And it, luckily, some people do find switching from high oxalate to a carnivore diet without a lot of drama until two or three years in. Because this body is taking a while to fix the kidneys and different things, and then eventually you get into the deep work. And the deep work of healing from this can happen in year three and beyond. We need to alkalize this mess. You're going to feel terrible when you're going acid. All this inflammation is making you go acid. And so lemons and, and Alka-Seltzer gold, you can read about this in my book. You can come to a group meeting. Doing the sauna, I love the sauna for turning back down the inflammation. Oxalate is turning up the inflammation. You go to sauna, turn it down. Oxalate turns up, sauna turn down. Like, keep doing the sauna a lot. That can be great, and so on, cold therapies. Oral minerals are super important. The binder of oxalic acid is calcium. You've got to use calcium to help your body. That is helping you recover, as are other minerals and electrolytes. And definitely, you need a break. Let your body do the work. When do you heal? The janitors come out and they clean up the mess at night when you're sleeping. And sometimes the sleep isn't so good. And you wake up the next day and you're like, that was quite a night. You wake you step out on the floor and your foot's all swollen. You're going to need a nap because that sleep was so much work. You didn't really get good sleep. So this is the kind of attitude you need to have. Compassion for life, the life that's healing you, your power to heal. You can support it by taking a nap and canceling your lunch date and getting off committees and, and living your life, experiencing this healing. We're, I want to go to Q&A because we promised 10 minutes of Q&A. Just take a minute and think about the world that our friends and family live in. They live in a world afraid of meat, all hot on juices and smoothies still after 20 years of this, like no one's over it. Chiable, they're all acting like it's new. It, this, all these things are getting us in trouble. When you stop eating dairy, you cut out so much calcium, you cut out your one binder that has the chance of protecting you from your high oxalate diet a little bit, like 15%. Not, you can't compensate this. You can't cook this out of your food. You need to quit eating it. And this, the way people are being told to eat is not working. And if you can convince someone to trade in their spinach and eat these instead, that would be great. What if they could get out of pain by just switching from spinach? How huge is that? It's free. There are things to look out for in keto. Get really good white pepper, not like your standard grocery store pepper if you don't love white pepper. The truth is that we've been relying on meat for two million years. It is not as toxic as French fries, like everyone says. And vegetables aren't really as great as everyone says. But how do you say to people, Everything you think is wrong. <laughs> You're never popular when you say that. Have you noticed that? All right, so here we are in the geeky, unpopular space of people who go to the library and say, oh, look what I found. I know you don't want to hear this, but just in case, just in case you do, that's what we're here for. So let's do a little Q&A and see where we go from there. Thank you. I really can't see you guys, so. Hello? Oh. Yes, I hi. have these bumps on my fingers, these nodes or nodules. Could that have anything to do with oxalates? Most definitely. Oh, yeah. No. And some of them go away. I mean, I have plenty of clients who are saying their no nodules and bumps and stuff are going away. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. It Thank is you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. My name is Greg. Very helpful. I have a history of uh, 30 years of calcium oxalate kidney stones, unpassable and very painful. When I went to keto back in 2018, uh, that lessened. They were less frequent and they were passable. They were smaller stones, but I was still eating the chocolate, the almonds, the spinach. 
I went to carnivore a year ago. I haven't had any kidney stones at all since then. My question is, should I expect that to continue if I continue to eat this way, to never experience to calcium not. oxalate stones again? Well, you want to protect your kidneys. So the things that help protect the kidneys are enough magnesium and citric acid and citrates. The body will put out citrates if your system's not real acid. So anything you do to stay alkaline and if you, you know, if you feel like you're now moving from the rest of the body, I think what happens in the first few years is the kidney healing. And once that's, once your kidneys are really clearing oxalate better from the blood because you've cleaned out this mess, the rest of the body is going to be like, about time. Yeah and they're going to try to bomb your kidneys with us. So you want to be really mindful that you're probably loaded with oxalate elsewhere and you got this journey to go. So, but yeah, it's really amazing, the healing potential. Even 30 years of really serious kidney stones starts to clear up. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Sally. Uh, I was wondering your thoughts on uh, blood sugars and relating uh, to oxalates. And then also a little bit about muscle tissue and soreness, myofascial type pains, things like that. The myofascial tightening is really interesting because when your body is under a lot of inflammation, the molecules in your connective tissue literally change position. And they now turn a different face out to the outside of their surfaces and they become really sticky. So we see this in the oxalate clearing when the inflammation goes up, you get this fascia tightening that's really painful and you feel shrink wrapped. And so sometimes you have great joint range of motion in your joints and muscles, but because of the inflammation, you experience this tightness. Um, and then what was the first part of your question? Uh, blood sugars. Yeah, blood sugars is so interesting because there's not a lot of research in it, but many researchers talk about how much oxalate is probably related to insulin resistance and diabetes. And there's many ways that it's messing things up. At the glandular level where you've got oxalates in your pancreas and your thyroid gland and your pituitary gland, is just me the whole orchestration and, and overall control of the system is compromised by hormonal uh, derangements that occur from that. And then you have oxalates sitting on the enzymes in the mitochondria and outside the mitochondria because that very last step of um, glycolysis is broken by oxalates sitting on that, sitting on that um, enzyme. And it's happening in four places. It's happening in the electron transport chain. It's, it's interfering with energy production in cells. And it's also interfering with glucose generation. So a lot of us who have a history of oxalate poisoning don't do well on zero carb and shouldn't be on zero carb continuously. Really low, uh, two keto is really hard on the body because it's struggling to make the glutathione in the muscles and liver and struggling to keep the blood sugar where it needs to be. So there's, you know, you got to work with this and kind of get to know your body. It's all about getting to know what's working for your body or not and be willing to hear the message. Maybe you need a little bit of carbs. Thanks. Great talk, Sally. Thanks. Two questions related. Uh, what is a mega dose of vitamin C in maybe milligrams? And what's the pathway where vitamin C becomes oxalates for the process? Yeah, they're trying to figure out this whole endogenous production thing. And they, they talk about how vitamin C can spontaneously generate oxalate by itself without enzymatic pathways. But it also probably comes through the same pathway that um, others do. There's these three precursors to oxalate. So it gets, there's enzymatic pathways where it becomes part of this precursor system that they're trying to study. John Knight is still working. His two buddies are retiring now. The three of them have been... The, the, the knights, you might say, the superheroes of oxalate research relative to the diet side of it. And he's got another grant to look again at vitamin C. He's been studying things like the collagen and how much gelatin it takes. So too much vitamin C is pretty much much over between two to 400 milligrams, you're overdoing it. So 400 milligrams would be the upper limit on a healthy diet. And that, you know, your cells only need a fair small amount. But when you have inflammation going on, you have more immune cells turning over, you need more vitamin C. And vitamin C can be a useful way to slow down oxalate dumping as you're using it as a way to generate oxalate in the body. But we see this with small amounts. So 50 milligrams or maybe 75, three to four times a day is enough to raise um, the oxalate and to support the immune system enough and it seems to help the system calm down. But if you're taking more than half a gram, like more than 500 a day, it's really uh, not really a great idea. Thank you. 
Hi, Sally. I have a question for you. Um, I am a third year carnivore, and I am. I was great, and now I'm having oxalate dumping. And I heard you talk about that um, on a YouTube video. Can you please talk about that? Yeah, it's really surprising. I see this a lot, and I have a. a Several clients, one who's really sick in my head, he went full carnivore after being deeply keto, really like almond flour, almond flour, almond flour. And he was fine for three years. And then he was so sick, all of a sudden, just so suddenly sick three years later. So it's really important for the next 10 years after you get off Oxley to be paying attention. In this three-year area, when people, even people who experience symptoms immediately, they know their system is now in this difficult clean-out mode, they... Um, it starts to get worse in year three, and it's really difficult emotionally to be on this roller coaster where you feel so much better and you feel a little worse, and you see this in and out, day in and day out, but then you see it on a bigger pattern, like the first six months were like the honeymoon, and now I'm deep in this marriage that is not going well here in year three. So it's really important here to know these tools about using the vitamin C or adding some tea or some olives and some things that have oxalate. And I teach you in the book, the back of the book in page 288 has a whole dosing chart in there about how much, if you need to add 30 milligrams of oxalate to a meal, this would be how much you would use of X thing. So you want to start dosing oxalate, you want to address it acidity. And um, I might have a slide in here for that. We're off, so we can't show your slides anyway. But you want to address the acidity, you want to keep the minerals going. There's things you can do to help you get through it, and sometimes it's just hard. Hi. Um, my question is, if somebody has high oxalates and it's already on a low oxalate diet, how much would that person need to avoid bone broth? And if you could explain the relation of glycine with the oxalates. Uh, the relation of what? Of glycine or, oh, glycine, or yeah. collagen with the so oxalates. So the collagen are those uh, connective tissue amino acids that can break down into oxalate. And according to John Knight, he says about seven grams of collagen or gelatin is enough to generate oxalate in the body in, in a way that shows up in the urine significantly. So you'd want to keep your gelatin intake under a tablespoon of gelatin a day, and your standard broth is not standard. So the amount of those gelatinous amino acids depends on how thick and, you know, how much like jello or how liquid it is will we'll give you a sense of how much um, glycine and hydroxyproline is worse than glycine. So in, when you're making gelatin at home, you know what the final gelatin nature is, and your one tablespoon gives you two cups of gel material. So based on that, you can tell that you could probably get away with a whole cup of gelled material a day. Um, but I think you should use bone broth as a culinary tool to deglaze your pan and make delicious gravies and delicious sauces and soups. You don't use it as a superfood. You don't need to do that. There's other ways to turn on the chondrocytes and make your joints happier. And the best way is to first stop poisoning it. Thank you. I can't believe we have 50 seconds left. I could be talking for the next six days and we're wasting 49 seconds? Oh, here we go. Hi, Sally. How are you doing? Okay, <laughs> so just a question uh, regarding the collagen as far as like peptides, that's bad? Or are you talking like all well, collagens? It's, it's the amino acid hydroxyproline and glycine. There's a few other suspects, but they keep talking about hydroxyproline. So it's the amount of that amino acid. If it's breaking down that amino acid and there's too much around and the body, you know, there's there's different elements that are going to affect how much that's a problem. If you have a lot of inflammation, that's going to be more of a problem. Okay. And if you, but it's, it's tiny compared to a spinach smoothie. You know, like you're doing so well on these other things. I just think collagen is being abused right yeah, now. Yeah, because I mean, if we're getting collagen in our meat and so forth, then that should be good, especially yeah, for all it, carnivore versus using collagen powder, peptides. Some people are, are throwing collagen into every recipe they do. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So our time is officially over. I am so grateful that Oxley got to be here today. Gee, that is a miracle. Thank you.